Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's for me a great, great honor to welcome Javier Millet. As you know, he's the freely elected president of uh, Argentina. And it's actually your first trip to a foreign country after you have been elected. First, congratulations for your election. And congratulations also to your sister who managed your um, election campaign. I think you, sometimes people would say with more radical methods, but you introduce a new spirit to Argentina, making Argentina much more related to free enterprise, to entrepreneurial activities, also to bring Argentina back to the rule of law. So we have a very extraordinary person among us today. And of course, we are all eager uh, to listen to you. And again, a very cordial welcome to the World Economic Forum. Good afternoon. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Hoy estoy acá Today I'm here para decirles que Occidente to tell está you en that peligro. the Western world is in danger. Está en peligro porque and aquellos que supuestamente deben defender los valores de Occidente se encuentran cooptados por una visión del mundo que inexorablemente conduce al socialismo y en consecuencia a la and thereby to poverty. Lamentablemente, Unfortunately, en las últimas décadas, in recent decades, motivados por algunos deseos bien pensantes de querer ayudar al well prójimo y otros por el deseo de pertenecer a una casta privilegiada, others, others los principales líderes del mundo occidental han abandonado el modelo de la libertad por distintas versiones de lo que llamamos colectivismo. Nosotros estamos acá para decirles que los experimentos colectivistas collectivist nunca son la solución a los problemas que aquejan a los ciudadanos del mundo to the problems that afflict the citizens of the world. Rather, Créanme, they are the root cause. Nadie mejor que nosotros, los argentinos, para dar no testimonios de estas dos cuestiones. Argentines, to testify to these two Cuando points. adoptamos el modelo de la libertad, allá por el año 1860, freedom, back in 1865, en 35 years we became a leading world power, and when we embraced collectivism over the course of the last 100 years, we saw how our citizens started to become systematically impoverished, and we dropped to spot number 140 globally. But before having the discussion, it would first be important for us to take a look at the data that demonstrates why free enterprise Capitalism is not just the only possible system to end world poverty, but also that it's the only morally desirable system to achieve this. If we look at the history of economic progress, we can see how between the year zero and the year 1800, approximately, world per capita GDP practically remained constant throughout the whole reference period. If you look at the graph of the evolution of economic growth Uno estaría viendo un gráfico con la forma de un palo de hockey, una función exponencial an exponential function that remained constant for 90% of the time and which was exponentially triggered starting in the 19th century. The only exception to this history of stagnation was in the late 15th century with the discovery of the American continent. But for this exception, throughout the whole period between the year zero and the year 1800, global per capita GDP stagnated. Now, it's not just that capitalism brought about an explosion in wealth from the moment que, it was adopted si as an economic datos, system. But also, if you look at the este data, what you will see is that growth continues to accelerate throughout the whole Durante period. Period, and throughout the whole period, between 1800, the year zero and the year 1800, per capita the per, per capita GDP growth rate remains stable at around 0.02% annually, so almost no growth. 
a partir del siglo XIX, con la revolución industrial, la tasa de crecimiento pasa al 0,66%. A ese ritmo, para duplicar el PBI per cápita, se necesitarían crecer durante 107 años. Ahora bien, si observamos el periodo entre 1900 y 1950, la tasa de crecimiento se acelera al 1,66% anual. Ya no necesitamos 107 años para duplicar el PBI per cápita, sino 66. Si tomamos el periodo comprendido entre 1950 y el año 2000, vemos que la tasa de crecimiento fue de 2,1% anual, lo que derivaría en que en solo 33 años podríamos duplicar el PIB per cápita del mundo. Esta tendencia, lejos de detenerse, se mantiene viva aún hoy. Si tomamos el periodo entre el año 2000 y el 2023, la tasa de crecimiento volvió a acelerar el 3% anual, lo que implica que podríamos duplicar nuestro PIB per cápita en el mundo en tan solo 23 años. Ahora bien, cuando se estudia el PBI per cápita desde el año 1800 al día de hoy, lo que se observa es que luego de la revolución industrial, el PBI per cápita mundial se multiplicó por más de 15 veces, generando una explosión de riqueza que sacó de la pobreza al 90% de la población mundial. No debemos olvidar nunca que para el año 1800, cerca del 95% de la población mundial vivía en la pobreza más extrema, mientras que ese número cayó al 5% para el año 2020 previo a la pandemia. La conclusión es obvia. Dejo de ser la causa de nuestros problemas, el capitalismo de libre empresa como sistema económico es la única herramienta que tenemos para terminar con el hambre, la pobreza y la indigencia a lo largo y a lo ancho de todo el planeta. La evidencia empírica es incuestionable. Por eso, como no cabe duda de que el capitalismo de libre mercado es superior en términos productivos, la doxa de izquierda ha atacado al capitalismo por sus cuestiones de moralidad, o ser, según ellos, dicen sus detractores, que es injusto. Dicen que el capitalismo es malo porque es individualista, y que el colectivismo es bueno porque es altruista, es altruista. Y en consecuencia, bregan por la justicia social. Pero este concepto que en el primer mundo se ha puesto de moda en la última época, en mi país es una constante del discurso político desde hace más de 80 años. El problema es que la justicia social no es justa, sino que tampoco aporta el bienestar general. Muy por el contrario, es una idea intrínsecamente injusta, porque es violenta. Es injusta porque el Estado se financia a través de impuestos, y los impuestos se cobran de manera Coactiva. ¿O acaso alguno de nosotros puede decir que paga los impuestos de manera voluntaria? Lo cual significa que el Estado se financia a través de la coacción y que a mayor carga impositiva, mayor es la coacción, menor es la libertad. Quienes promueven la justicia social parten de la idea de que el conjunto de la economía es una torta que se puede repartir de una manera distinta. Pero esa torta no está dada. Es riqueza que se va generando en lo que, por ejemplo, Israel Kirchner llama un proceso de descubrimiento de mercado. Si el bien o servicio que ofrece una empresa no es deseado, esa empresa quiebra a menos que se adecue a lo que el mercado le está demandando. Si genera un producto de buena calidad a un buen precio, atractivo, le va a ir bien y va a producir más. De modo que el mercado es un proceso de descubrimiento en el cual el capitalista encuentra sobre la marcha el rumbo correcto. Pero si el Estado castiga al capitalista por tener éxito y lo bloquea en este proceso de descubrimiento, destruye sus incentivos. Y las consecuencias de eso es que va a producir menos y la torta será más chica, generando perjuicio para el conjunto de la sociedad. El colectivismo, al inhibir estos procesos de descubrimiento y al dificultar la apropiación de los descubierto, ata al emprendedor de las manos y le imposibilita producir mejores bienes y ofrecer mejores servicios a un mejor precio. ¿Cómo puede ser entonces que desde la academia, los organismos internacionales, la política y la teoría económica se demonice un sistema económico que no solo ha sacado la pobreza más extrema al 90% de la población mundial y lo hace cada vez más rápido, sino que además es justo y moralmente superior? Gracias al capitalismo de libre empresa, 
pasa que el mundo se encuentra en su mejor momento. No hubo nunca en toda la historia de la humanidad un momento de mayor prosperidad que el que vivimos hoy. El mundo de hoy es más libre, más rico, más pacífico, más próspero que cualquier otro momento de nuestra historia. Esto es cierto para todos, pero en particular para aquellos países que son libres donde respetan la libertad económica y los derechos de propiedad de los individuos. Porque aquellos países que son libres son 12 veces más ricos que los reprimidos. El decir más bajo la distribución de los países libres vive mejor que el 90% de la población de los países reprimidos. Tiene 25 veces menos cantidad de pobres en el formato estándar, 50 veces menos en el formato extremo. Y por si eso fuera poco, los ciudadanos de los países libres viven un 25% más que los ciudadanos de los países reprimidos. Ahora bien, para entender que venimos a defender, es importante definir de acá hablamos nosotros cuando hablamos de libertarismo. Para definirlo, retomo las palabras del máximo prócer de las ideas de la libertad de Argentina, el profesor Alberto Venegas Lynch, hijo que dice, el libertarismo es el respeto y respeto del proyecto de vida del prójimo, basado en el principio de no agresión, en defensa del derecho a la vida, a la libertad, y a la propiedad. Cuyas instituciones fundamentales son la propiedad privada, los mercados libres de intervención estatal, la libre competencia, la división del trabajo y la cooperación social. Donde solo se puede ser exitoso sirviendo al prójimo con bienes de mejor calidad a un mejor precio. Dicho de otro modo, el capitalista, el empresario exitoso, es un benefactor social que lejos de apropiarse de la riqueza ajena contribuye al bienestar general. En definitiva, un empresario exitoso es un héroe. Este es el modelo que nosotros estamos proponiendo para la Argentina del futuro. Un modelo basado en los principios fundamentales del libertarismo. La defensa de la vida, de la libertad y de la propiedad. Ahora bien, si el capitalismo de libre empresa y la libertad económica han sido herramientas extraordinarias para terminar con la pobreza en el mundo, y nos encontramos hoy en el mejor momento de la historia de la humanidad, vale la pena preguntarse por qué digo entonces que Occidente está en peligro. Digo que Occidente está en peligro justamente porque en aquellos países que deberíamos defender los valores del libre mercado, la propiedad privada y las demás instituciones del libertarismo, sectores del establishment político y económico, algunos por errores en su marco teórico y otros por ambición de poder, están socavando los fundamentos del libertarismo, abriéndole las puertas al socialismo y condenándonos potencialmente a la pobreza, a la miseria y al estancamiento. Porque nunca debe olvidarse que el socialismo es siempre y en todo lugar un fenómeno empobrecedor, que fracasó en todos los países que se intentó, un fracaso en lo económico, un fracaso en lo social, un fracaso en lo cultural y además asesinó a más de 100 millones de seres humanos. El problema esencial de Occidente hoy es que no solo debemos enfrentarnos a quienes, aún luego de la caída del muro y la evidencia empírica abrumadora, siguen bregando por el socialismo empobrecedor, sino también a nuestros propios líderes, pensadores y académicos que, amparados en un marco teórico equivocado, socavan los fundamentos del sistema que nos ha dado la mayor expansión de riqueza y prosperidad de nuestra historia. El marco teórico al que me refiero es el de la teoría económica neoclásica, que diseña un instrumental que, sin quererlo, termina siendo funcional la intromisión del Estado, el socialismo y la degradación de la sociedad. El problema de los neoclásicos es que como el modelo del que se enamoraron no mapea contra la realidad, atribuyen el error a su supuesto paso del mercado, en vez de revisar las premisas de su modelo. Su pretexto de un supuesto paso de mercado, se introducen regulaciones que lo único que generan es distorsiones en el sistema de precios que impiden el cálculo económico y en consecuencia el ahorro, la inversión y el crecimiento. Este problema radica esencialmente en que ni siquiera los economistas supuestamente libertarios comprenden qué es el mercado, ya que, que si se comprendiera se vería rápidamente que es imposible que exista algo así como un fallo de mercado. El mercado no es una mera 
The market is not a mere graph describing a curve of supply and demand. The market is a mechanism of social cooperation where you voluntarily exchange ownership rights. Therefore, based on this definition, talking about a market failure is an oxymoron. No existe el fallo de mercado. There are si no las transacciones son voluntarias, el único contexto en el que puede haber un fallo de mercado es si hay coacción. Is if there y el único con la capacidad de coaccionar de manera generalizada es el Estado que tiene el monopolio de la violencia. En consecuencia, si alguien considera que hay un fallo de mercado, les recomendaría que revisen si hay intervención estatal en el medio. Y si encuentran que no hay intervención estatal en el medio, les sugiero que hagan de nuevo el análisis porque definitivamente está mal. Los fallos de mercado no existen. Market failures do not exist. An example of these so-called market failures described by the neoclassicals are the concentrated structures of the economy. However, sin funciones que presenten rendimientos crecientes a escala, cuya contrapartida son las estructuras concentradas de la economía. No podríamos explicar el crecimiento económico desde el año 1800 hasta hoy. Fíjense qué interesante. Until today, isn't this interesting? Desde el año 1800 en adelante, con la población multiplicándose más de 8 o 9 veces, el producto per cápita creció más de 15 veces. Es decir, existen rendimientos crecientes. Eso llevó la pobreza extrema del 95% al 5%. Sin embargo, esas presencias de rendimientos crecientes implican estructuras concentradas. Lo que se llamaría, por ejemplo, monopolio. ¿Cómo puede ser que algo que haya generado tanto bienestar para la teoría neoclásica, eso es un fallo de mercado? Los economistas neoclásicos salgan de la caja. Cuando el modelo falla, no hay que enojarse con la realidad, hay que enojarse con el modelo y cambiarlo. El dilema que enfrenta el modelo neoclásico es que dicen querer perfeccionar el funcionamiento del mercado atacando a los que ellos consideran fallos, pero al hacerlo no solo abren las puertas del socialismo, sino que atentan contra el crecimiento económico. Ejemplo, regular monopolios, excluirle las ganancias y destrozar los rendimientos crecientes automáticamente destruiría el crecimiento económico. Dicho de otro modo, cada vez que ustedes quieran hacer una corrección de un supuesto fallo de mercado, inexorablemente, por desconocer lo que es el mercado, o por haberse enamorado de un modelo fallido, están abriendo las puertas al socialismo, y están condenando a la gente a la pobreza. Sin embargo, Frente a la demostración teórica de que la intervención del Estado es perjudicial, la evidencia empírica de que fracasó porque no podía ser de otra manera, la solución que propondrán los colectivistas no es mayor libertad, sino que es mayor regulación, generar una espiral descendente de regulaciones hasta que todos seamos más pobres y que a la vida de todos nosotros dependa de un burócrata sentado en una oficina de la vida. Dado el estrepitoso fracaso de los modelos colectivistas y los innegables, Given the dismal failure of collectivist models and the undeniable advances in the free world, socialists were forced to change their agenda. They left behind the class struggle based on the economic system and replaced this with other supposed social conflicts which are just as harmful to life as a community and to economic growth. The first of these new battles was the ridiculous and unnatural fight between man and woman. Libertarianism already provides for equality que todos los hombres somos creados iguales, que todos tenemos los mismos derechos inalienables otorgados por el Creador, entre los que se encuentran la vida, la libertad y la propiedad. En lo único que devino esta agenda del feminismo radical es en mayor intervención del Estado para entorpecer el proceso económico, darle trabajo a burócratas que no le aportaron nada a la sociedad, sea en formato de ministerios de la mujer o organismos internacionales dedicados a promover esta agenda. Otro de los conflictos que los socialistas plantean es del hombre contra la naturaleza. Sostienen que los seres humanos dañamos el planeta y que debe ser protegido a toda costa. Incluso llegando a abogar por mecanismo de control poblacional o en la agenda sangrienta del aborto. Lamentablemente, 
Estas ideas nocivas han pregnado fuertemente en nuestra sociedad. Los neomarxistas han sabido cooptar el sentido común de Occidente. Oraron esto gracias a la apropiación de los medios de comunicación, de la cultura, de las universidades, y sí, también de los organismos internacionales. Este último caso es el más grave, tal vez, porque se trata de instituciones que tienen enorme influencia en las decisiones políticas y económicas de los países que integran esos organismos multilaterales. The multilateral Por suerte, organizations. somos cada vez más los que nos atrevemos a levantar la voz, porque vemos que si no combatimos frontalmente estas ideas, el único destino posible es que cada vez ideas, vamos a tener más Estado, más regulación, más socialismo, más pobreza, menos libertad y, en consecuencia, peor nivel de vida. Occidente, lamentablemente, ya comenzó a transitar este camino. Sé que a muchos les puede sonar ridículo plantear que Occidente se ha volcado al socialismo, pero solo es ridículo en la medida que uno se restringe a la, red, a la definición económica tradicional del socialismo, que establece que es un sistema económico donde el Estado es el dueño de los medios de producción. Esta definición debería ser desde mi punto de vista, actualizada a las circunstancias presentes. Hoy los Estados no necesitan controlar directamente los medios de producción para controlar cada aspecto de la vida de los individuos, con herramientas como la emisión monetaria, el endeudamiento, los subsidios, el control de la tasa de interés, los controles de precios y las regulaciones para corregir los supuestos fallos de mercado pueden controlar los destinos de millones de seres humanos. Así es como llegamos al punto en el que, con distintos nombres o formas, buena parte de las ofertas políticas generalmente aceptadas en la mayoría de los países de Occidente son variantes colectivistas, ya sea que se declamen abiertamente comunistas, fascistas, nazis, socialistas, socialdemócratas, nacionalsocialistas, demócratas cristianos, keynesianos, neokeynesianos, progresistas, populistas, nacionalistas o globalistas. En el fondo no hay diferencias sustantivas. Todos sostienen que el Estado debe dirigir todos los aspectos de la vida de los individuos. Todas definen un modelo contrario al que llevó a la humanidad al progreso más espectacular de su historia. Nosotros venimos hoy aquí a invitar a los demás países de Occidente a que retomemos el camino de la prosperidad, la libertad económica, el gobierno limitado y el respeto y respeto de la propiedad privada son elementos esenciales para el crecimiento económico. Este fenómeno de empobrecimiento que produce el colectivismo no es una fantasía y tampoco fatalismo. Es una realidad que los argentinos conocemos muy bien desde hace por lo menos 100 años. Porque ya lo vivimos, ya pasamos por esto. Porque como dije antes, desde que decidimos abandonar el modelo de la libertad que nos había hecho ricos, estamos atrapados en una espiral descendente donde cada día somos más pobres. Esto es, ya lo vivimos nosotros. So y estamos acá para alertarlos through, acerca de lo que puede pasar si los países de Occidente, que se hicieron ricos con el modelo de la libertad, continúan por este camino de servidumbre. Freedom, el caso argentino es la demostración empírica de que no Argentina importa cuán rico seas, cuántos no recursos naturales tengas, be, no importa cuán capacitada esté la población, y cuán educada sea, y cuántos lingotes de oro haya en la arca si se adoptan medidas que entorpecen el libre el funcionamiento de los mercados, la libre competencia, los sistemas de precios libres, si se entorpece el comercio, si se atenta contra la propiedad privada, el único destino posible es la pobreza. Por lo tanto, para finalizar, quiero darles un mensaje a todos los empresarios aquí presentes y a los que no están, pero nos están siguiendo desde todas partes del planeta. No se dejen amedrentar ni por la casta política ni por los parásitos que viven del Estado. No se entreguen a una clase política que lo único que quiere es perpetuarse en el poder y mantener sus privilegios. Ustedes son benefactores sociales. Ustedes son héroes. Ustedes son los creadores del periodo de 
spectators of the most extraordinary period of prosperity we've ever seen. No one tell you that your ambition is immoral. If you make money, it's because you offer a better product and a better price, thereby contributing to general well-being. Do not surrender to the advance of the state. The state is not the solution. The state is the problem. You are the true protagonist of this story. And rest assured that as from today, Argentina is your strong partner. Muchísimas gracias y viva la libertad caracol. Prime Minister Sanchez, welcome back to Davos, and uh, congratulations on your re-election. Um, I would like to start um, off by thanking you for your friendship and commitment. This is uh, your fifth time in Davos physically, and then you even joined us when we had to do it virtually. So thank you very much uh, for that. And, um, also, I would like to underline that you just um, concluded a very successful and eventful presidency of the European Union, achieving some key milestones, such as an agreement of the electricity market, the Critical Raw Materials Act, and Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, to mention a few. And of course, um, most important was the start of the accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova that took place under the Spanish presidency. Your government has also led a robust economic performance despite uh, global turbulence. Um, uh, that uh, is also a major achievement. So, Prime Minister, I invite you again to share with us your vision for Europe and for Spain and uh, your country's role in Europe and in the world. So, welcome. So thank you very much, Borg, and thanks, uh, dear friends. Uh, so I, I will start with an exercise uh, stating, like, imagine for a moment that, that we are uh, in the year 2013, in the 60th edition of this forum. Imagine that, uh, that the world has failed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Imagine that the planet's temperature has risen for more, more than 1.5 degrees, causing the degradation of our ecosystems, uh, and uh, that our GDP has fallen by 15 points. Imagine that fake news and, and political polarization have uh, reduced the number of democracies that the advance of uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence, intelligence has not properly governed and has increased inequality and expelled millions of people from the labor market. Imagine this scenario and tell me, would it be good for your business? More importantly, would it be good for your children, for your grandchildren, for your friends, for your fellow citizens? Because the future I'm describing to you is not a, a dystopia. It is a possible future. A likely projection of the world we will end up having if we let ourselves be carried away by inertia or resignation. The stakes are high. 76 countries, more than half of uh, the world's population, will hold elections this year and uh, crucial political decisions will have to be made regarding some of the main societal uh, dilemmas we face. So here I would like to refer to three of them that I consider particularly timely. 
The first concerns the very survival of the rules-based international order that has brought us so much prosperity since the end of the World War II. Spain is a full democracy. It is an open, modern, and tolerant country that defends the European project, but also the globalist dream that inspired the creation of the UN and the Bretton Woods institutions. That is why we are committed to economic openness, to international solidarity, and uh, to the multilateral system, a system that is uh, threatened by those who promote fragmentation, intimidation, or the use of force to impose their interest and will. It is happening in Ukraine, a country that is fighting for its freedom against Putin's authoritarianism, and uh, where millions of people have been displaced uh, from their homes. And let me be clear, we support Ukraine, and we welcome their recent announcement of Future Peace Summit that upholds the principles and values and dreams in the UN Charter. It is also happening in Syria, where a, no, a now forgotten war has taken the lives of more than 300,000 souls, 4,000 last year alone. And it is happening in Gaza, where 24,000 people have died in just 100 days, and hundreds of thousands stand on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. Elderly people, women, innocent children who have lost their homes, their jobs, their families. Of course, and now are on the verge of losing their homes and hope. We recognize Israel the legitimate right to defend itself against a vil and monstrous terrorist attack. But we also demand the respect of international humanitarian law. That is why here today I would like to reiterate once again the need for an immediate ceasefire and for convening an international conference to implement a definitive solution to this long-lasting conflict. A solution that recognizes the existence of two states, Israel and Palestine, living in peace and security. I want to do so because this human drama must be stopped because the current course of events uh, will not help either the Palestinian people nor the Israeli, but also because what, it, what is at stake is the security of the global supply chain. It is trade, prosperity, the stability of the entire Middle East, and the continuity of the multilateral order. Friends, the future, st the future stability of the world is being decided in Ukraine and Gaza while we speak. So we cannot get this wrong as we got it uh, wrong in other places. We must be coherent and uphold the same principles and values whatever and whenever there is a breach. We have to push for dialogue, for the rule of law and for peace. The second global challenge I would like uh, to share with you is that we need to address the governance of artificial intelligence. Look, I am a firm believer of scientific progress. I'm sure that the AI and other cutting-edge technologies are the best, uh, the best option we have to overcome challenges such as aging, the environmental crisis, the spread of diseases, or, or low productivity. And that, if we use them well, they will allow us to reach unimagined levels of welfare. But I also believe that this opportunity should not make us ignore the threats. Polls reveal that a majority of citizens think AI will destroy their jobs, widen the gap between the rich and the poor, and worsen their standards of living. And we must listen to these fears. We must pay more attention to the concerns of our workers, our youth, our elders, and less attention, if I may, to the empty promises of some Silicon Valley gurus who are more interested in gaining followers or climbing the Forbes list than in the true progress of humanity. 
Our duty is to understand that people's concerns are not ignored, that the danger is real, and that we should give them an effective and coordinated, coordinated response. Today, more than ever, the world needs a global governance of digitalization, a governance that uh, defends the fundamental rights of citizens above the interests of states and corporations, a governance that tackles the cyber threats, deep fakes, toxic lies that circulate online and threaten our democracies and the very safety of our children. A governance that guarantees that AI systems do not uh, incorporate discriminatory biases or, or replicate all injustice while it facilitates innovation and investments for the development of this technology. That is the purpose of the European AI regulation recently approved under the Spanish presidency of the Council. And, and please do not uh, take me for a uh, uh, I'm a staunch defender of technolog technological progress. I am, not, uh, I am the president of the country that is determined to have a leading role in the current industrial revolution. A country that has launched a strategic plan with more than 12.5 billion euros to foster semiconductor manufacturing in Spain. A country that leads the European rankings on the digitalization of the public sector and that has just launched one of the 10 most powerful supercomputers in the world. I firmly believe that digitalization will have good and necessary, that it will make life better for all of us. But I also believe that history teaches that this result will not come by itself. We will have to fight for it, and we are going to do it for the sake of our children and our planet. Those of us who learned to, not, uh, to believe in the invisible hand of the market cannot now profess blind faith in the invisible hand of artificial intelligence. Invisibility is usually sold to the devil, not good. I only trust the hands of flesh and bone. The hands or the ones that rise the shutter of a business every morning, the ones that hold the book at school, make dinner at night for their family, or cast a vote in the ballot box. I care. I care for those hands, real and visible. That is why I believe that the third major challenge ahead of, uh, of us is to ensure the prosperity of our citizens. The far right is growing. Autocratic regimes are proliferating in the West and other regions of the world. But the truth is that this terrible trend is only a symptom of deeper problems. One of them is the erosion of the middle and working classes. The same middle and working classes that uh, have uh, not always benefited from the economic transformations of the last few decades that suffered during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2012, and that now are anguished about the future uh, marked by uncertainty while they keep losing purchasing power. Life is expensive. It already was before Putin's war, and uh, the pandemic combined to unleash an inflationary crisis. Saving some money, buying a home, or simply going on vacation is becoming increasingly difficult for a growing part of the world's population. And that, that is a problem. A betrayal to those who build this system with their hard work and sacrifice, and to whom we owe everything. Democracy, social justice, and freedom. So we must stop this erosion, and we must do so without turning our backs on our values the environmental crisis or the needs of the poorer countries. In short, we must be bold and define a new paradigm of prosperity, a new economic and social orthodoxy that takes advantage of the knowledge and the new tools we have to couple economic growth with environmental sustainability and prosperity for all. I'm, I'm, fully, I'm fully aware that this is the goal pursued by many governments around the world of different ideologies. And I must tell you that this is ultimately the main project
that my country, Spain, is undertaking. In recent years, we have shown that it is possible to create wealth and improve workers' conditions at the same time. We have increased the minimum wage by 54%. We have expanded labor rights. We have reduced temporary employment inequality and poverty. And we have created more than 2 million new jobs, many of them in high-value-added sectors, such as the tech industry. At the same time, we have grown above the Eurozone and the OECD average. We have been one of the fastest in Europe in bringing down inflation. We have attracted more FDI than ever before, and our companies have produced record profits. In short, we have shown that economic competitiveness and the people's prosperity are not incompatible. Furthermore, we have also shown that it is possible to strengthen the welfare state while underpinning its sustainability. The advance in gender equality is not a, only a matter of justice, but uh, that it has a positive impact on economic growth, that investing in science, innovation, and human capital will result in long-term productivity gains. We have lowered uh, taxes for the middle and working classes and raised them for the wealthy. We have cut the public deficit by half. We have expanded the support that the state provides to both citizens and companies. We have implemented an unprecedented policies, billions of euros to support workers and households, free public transportation, and a pioneering minimum vital income that already benefits more than two million vulnerable people in my country. We have promoted policies that we are, or we were told were impossible or reckless, and yet they have proven to be possible and beneficial. Today, Spaniards know that neoliberal policies do not work, that the option of cutting the size of the public sector and leaving citizens and small businesses on their own when prob problems arise makes no sense, and that when we collaborate and stand to together, we are stronger. My country has shown that it's, that it's possible to grow while fighting climate change. I say that in five years, we have cut our consumption of natural resources by 7%, reduced our emission by 10 points, and increased our renewable energy production by 34%. In 2023, Spain generated half of its electricity from the sun, wind, and water. Uh, we have been the first major EU economy to achieve this. And these environmental advances have not made us poorer, nor have they made us less competitive. Quite the contrary. They have allowed us to develop new industries, create thousands of new jobs, and, and uh, generate energy at very competitive prices. Today, my country, Spain, households and businesses pay 58% less for the electricity bill than in 2022. But uh, to further succeed, this new model of prosperity will need to increase the involvement of the private sector. Companies are essential for the growth and well-being of our country. They create employment, innovation, territorial cohesion, opportunities to make us better. But the creation does not occur in a vacuum. You, your companies, are a product of democracy, a product of a rules-based international order and of welfare state that sustain the middle and working classes, that guarantee peace and ensure adequate levels of human capital and prosperity. Without the, these pillars, your business models would collapse like a house of cards. And for that reason, I call upon you to get involved. Help us to rise the purchasing power of workers, to stop the climate emergency, to vindicate international rules, and to defend democracy and fight the involution represented by the reactionary wave, wave sweeping the world. In short, in short, help us to give people a better life. Do not buy the old neoliberal postulates that portray the state as a poorly extractive entity that, uh, that doesn't know uh, 
uh, does not, sorry, generate value, or that claim that the only responsibility of companies is to increase the profits of their shareholders. These ideas have been proven wrong by science and by experience. You know it. You know that companies need governments to innovate and grow, and that if companies do not work together, if they do not align their interests with those of society as a whole, we will not be able to overcome the great challenges of our time. And this will have an impact for good on your businesses. So act accordingly, act responsibly, think in long term, do not allow yourselves to be dragged along by those radical media outlets and political parties that are obsessed with uh, projecting us as systemic rivals. That profit from selling polarization. Do not fall into their trap. Let's cooperate, let's collaborate. Let us uh, take advantage of the major challenges I mentioned earlier to build bridges, enhance synergies, and establish new forms of public-private cooperation and collaboration. The government of Spain is your ally. We have learned by our experience that there, there, there is a, a virtuous cycle between growth and redistribution of growth. That the best and the most resilient way of growing is by making sure that the benefits of growth reach the entire population, especially the most vulnerable. Spain is a paradise for those companies that want to prosper through innovation, talent, clean and cheap energy, institutional stability and top not infrastructure. For those companies that want to get rich by generating real value and paying their fair share of taxes, we welcome these companies with open arms. So dear friends, we are at the dawn of a crucial year, a year in which the future of the international order and of liberal societies will be shaped. Our citizens won't fail us. I'm sure they will be up to the task as they always are in the crucial moments. But it is important that governments and companies are too. We must work together to build a new prosperity, a new virtuous triangle formed by the private sector, the state and civil society that will allow us to guarantee economic prosperity and has enhance sorry, well-being and equality and ensure environmental sustainability for all and all across the world. It won't be easy, but it will be worth the effort. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, as you said, uh, FDI inflow to Spain uh, is uh, very high, the highest uh, you have seen uh, in the past. Uh, economic growth uh, is higher than the euro uh, average and also inflation lower. Do you think that some of your colleagues uh, in Europe can uh, learn something from your policies and what po policies do you think they should be inspired by? Thank you, thank you, Borg, for, for your question. I would say that we are living in a period that we need leaders that transform uh, uh, societies and not administrate societies. And so to keep that, is, that is stability, uh, political stability, social stability, economic stability within our societies, but also uh, thinking broader uh, at the European level, we need to transform ourselves to, to earn uh, competitiveness to understand that uh, climate change, digital transformations are uh, uh, big tools uh, for, the, for the good of our societies. And not to use some of the crises that we're facing, such as the war in Ukraine and the uh, uh, energy prices to uh, slow down or to put aside our uh, commitment uh, regarding the ecological transition of our economies. And uh, that, of course, uh, that idea of transformation means that, for instance, when we touch uh, our experience uh, chairing the European Council uh, during the last semester, 
uh, and the reform that you mentioned before, the uh, electoral reform, uh, you know, this has been a real and very complex debate. And I think, you know, the companies, I think also the Commission and the Parliament, by, because I think that we reach a very important agreement uh, for the good of, of our continent and, uh, and our competitiveness. Do you, Prime Minister, uh, think that sometimes we lack self-confidence uh, in Europe? Uh, you know, in 2012, um, international actors were saying that the euro was going to uh, be in really deep uh, problems, even challenged as a currency, still the second most important currency in the world. Then it was Greece that was going to go bust, and now, together with Spain, one of the fastest growing economies. You had one of the highest youth unemployments and unemployment rates, and uh, you are now in like a comeback uh, situation. And uh, we were going to also uh, be freezing the whole winter because of uh, making ourselves uh, independent of uh, Russian gas. Um, is it a little bit, do we have to explain also more the political processes we have in Europe when there are democratic states that come together? Of course there will be discussions. And then it usually ends up with something, but the media is writing so much about the process, so people think that maybe this is a mess, but this is democracy. This is democracy, it? and I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, the most wonderful experience that I I have from this debate around the table of the European Council is to see prime ministers and head of the states debating and trying to, to find a landing zone for the good of our societies. And this is democracy, we, and democracy needs, uh, or the, it has its uh, timing uh, to, to move for, for, uh, further. And I think that this is what we did, for instance, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, during the, uh, you know, the, this very important agreement on the uh, next generation funds, and of course uh, our common approach uh, uh, with regard to uh, the uh, conflict in, in Ukraine. So, you know, this is uh, the, the instruments that we have, and I think that this is the most important uh, strength that we as Europe uh, have. But maybe sometimes you think it's uh, of course is a little bit tough, of I, I, and uh, you also and, 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 and of course you know you, you, you were telling uh, uh, before you know in, in your remarks that of course we we have this uh, uh, Spanish presidency we open uh, the talks of negotiations with. Uh, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkans. Uh, there were some coffee hopefully. breaks there, weren't there? Uh, and, uh, and indeed, you know, uh, this enlargement will uh, table uh, the urgency and necessity to reform our institutions our, and our uh, decision-making process, you know, passing from a, you know, a unanimity to a qualified majority. But these are you know, like instruments, tools. Uh, the most important thing is the geopolitical shift that we are going to, to witness uh, in Europe in the coming years. And I think this is for good, and, uh, and uh, this will also stabilize, in my opinion, in the uh, short term and medium term, the situation in the uh, eastern uh, part of Europe. But in your speech, you also strongly underlined the importance of sticking uh, to core values, European values, UN Charter, democracy, and all this. And uh, we're seeing uh, currently a polarization uh, in, in the US. Uh, there is fundamental polarization. But aren't we seeing the same happening in the EU today? And um, are you afraid that this polarization will just escalate, or do you see possibilities for some convergence uh, moving forward? Uh, you were able to push through, for example, the accession of Ukraine and, and Moldova. That was not expected, but how do you see that? How, how, how is it possible uh, to get more convergence and not end up in a, a disagreeing on everything? So you have like three dimensions uh, uh, of the debate and three institutions in the European Union framework. The first one is uh, the European Council, and I, I see, you know, a common sense 
that we need to move further, even, even if, I mean, it doesn't matter if you belong to a right-wing political family or a, a left-wing political family. I mean, I think that there's a landing zone, uh, a common sense uh, to move further in some uh, issues, such as this uh, internal reform that we need to face uh, in order to be effective in, in, in the enlargement process. Then you have the Commission, and for that I believe that after the European elections what we need is to have a, 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 an agreement uh, among the major political families, Social Democrats, uh, the Popular Party, and also Liberals. And finally we have the European Parliament, and uh, for that I think it's crucial, it will be instrumental that our citizens, uh, you know, they uh, strength, I would say, the traditional families and not the far right in order to, to have uh, uh, the best out outcome of these uh, uh, elections and we can have a, a constructive uh, European Parliament. But, uh, but I have a, you know, a positive uh, instinct on what is going to happen in Europe in the coming years. I think that uh, we have learned a lot from the crisis that we suffered over the past four or five years, the pandemic but not only the pandemic, also the war in Ukraine. And, uh, and what we are going to witness is a more federal European Union and a more integrated European Union. I'm really happy to see that, uh, you know, we are opening ourselves to Western Balkans, which is a region that we, you know, are very committed. You, you see President Virchis is He's a good friend. Carefully. He's a good friend of, of Spain and myself. So, you know, happy to, to see him again here with me. and. Uh, and of course with Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. How, how, how historic was uh, the agreement on the accession of Ukraine and Moldova? I think it was, I mean, you know. Negotiations, we, we, accession we, we negotiations. Have, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, you know, we, I, I come from a country, uh, thanks to the leadership of Jacques Zeno, uh, Spain and Portugal, we uh, enter uh, the European Union back in uh, the 80s of last century. So, you know, we, we're very happy and very grateful to have been the presidency of the European Council in this very historical moment of the European Union project. So, uh, and I think it was a very important political message, the one that we sent to the Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian uh, government. And uh, let's hope that in the coming months we can end this war and respect the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine and we can, uh, you know, build uh, peace in the Middle East and the eastern side of Europe. And the West Balkans are the next EU members? Well, I, I mean, uh, that's, that's for sure, you know, we, we are very, very committed and very vocal, you know, Alexander knows, uh, on uh, his accession to the European Union. I think that uh, that will bring us uh, a lot of strength and we will provide uh, the stability that the, that part of, of, of the European Union or, the, or Europe needs. Muchas gracias. Thanks. So Once great again. to see you here again. And uh, we are now moving from uh, Prime Minister Sanchez and, and Spain to your friend uh, President Macron of France. Good friend. A good, friend it's a good segue. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs. C'est un grand Good honneur pour moi de vous présenter aujourd'hui un leader qui incarne l'esprit de réforme et d'innovation, le président de la République française, le Monsieur Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron. Depuis votre élection, Since you were elected, Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, vous vous êtes fermement établi comme un réformateur audacieux, s'attaquant avec vigueur au complexe de nos problèmes. En France, In France, le président a initié des réformes majeures visant à revitaliser l'économie, à moderniser economy, le marché du travail et market, à transformer and to le transform système de retraite. The pension system. Vouant ainsi son engagement indéfectif envers le progrès et la prospérité de son pays. Mais l'influence du président Macron dépasse largement les frontières de la France. Son cœur bat pour l'Europe. His heart beats Il est for Europe. un fervent défenseur de l'Union européenne, ouvrant sans relâche pour une Europe plus forte, plus unie for et plus résiliente. Sous votre direction, Europe. la France s'est affirmée comme un pilier France central de l'Union, promouvant l'intégration européenne et lutte contre les valeurs communes de and démocratie, a great of de liberté of et de solidarité. And solidarity. Sur la scène mondiale, On the global le président Macron est une voix de raison et de stabilité dans le monde marqué par des tensions in croissantes et un climat politique polarisé. Il plaide avec passion he pour le multilatéralisme et la coopération internationale. Que ce soit dans la lutte contre le changement climatique, change, dans la promotion de la paix et de la sécurité, security, ou dans la défense des droits humains, human le rights, monde a besoin de votre leadership. Veuillez accueillir le président de la République française, M. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron. Merci beaucoup, professeur Schwab, pour you very much, professor vos mots, Schwab, mesdames et messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, words. mesdames et messieurs les ministres, Dear ambassadrices, ambassadeurs, heads, mesdames et messieurs, on regrette les qualités, chers amis. Excellency, Je vais essayer d'être le plus efficace possible pour qu'on puisse be as possible, so that un we échange, mais as much je viens time as possible six ans après devant vous pour essayer de dire quelques mots et de vous dire où nous en sommes. And to tell you where we now stand. Je suis très heureux de retrouver beaucoup d'amis dans cette I'm salle et de visages familiers. Il y a six ans, je vous disais qu'on allait faire ago, beaucoup de réformes en France we et faire beaucoup de choses, choses en Europe pour qu'elles soient plus uniques, plus souveraines, plus efficaces. United, et, et donc je suis venu faire un rapport, and nous l'avons fait. Here. And I have come et c'est fort quand même de l'exécution de ce sur quoi je m'étais engagé que je viens parler devant vous. Et je vais ici le dire et le porter. En effet, ces dernières années, nous avons porté des réformes importantes pour le pays. On a réformé notre environnement fiscal en baissant les impôts de 60 milliards d'euros. C'est la taxe sur les entreprises qui est passée de 33 à 1 à 25 réduisant aussi la taxe sur les gains de capitaux en mettant en place une flat tax allégeant la fiscalité des entreprises comme des ménages, créant un crédit d'impôt industrie verte pour essayer d'attirer aussi les green tech dans notre pays. Nous avons simplifié beaucoup de secteurs, accéléré les procédures, investi également massivement dans des secteurs comme la santé, l'éducation, le travail. Nous avons engagé des réformes inédites sur le marché du travail, en passant les fameuses ordonnances travail en 2017, travail mener in 2017, des réformes de l'assurance chômage pour qu'elles soient plus comparables à nos voisins, et passer des réformes des retraites, y compris l'année dernière, dans un contexte politique qui était difficile, mais parce qu'elles nous paraissaient context, indispensables. À côté de ça, nous avons conduit aussi des réformes pour décarboner notre énergie, avec 
une planification écologique sur laquelle on a engagé tous les secteurs d'activité pour accompagner les ménages, les industries, notre agriculture. Et puis nous avons eu une politique très vigoureuse de développement de l'investissement public et privé, la création de nouveaux outils, d'un écosystème plus attractif et également en investissant massivement dans notre éducation nationale, notre enseignement supérieur et notre recherche avec un plan décennial. On a ajouté 25 milliards d'investissements et la formation des talents. Tout ça s'est complété d'une stratégie européenne ambitieuse. Nous avons ces dernières années, tous ensemble, eu à faire face à beaucoup de crises, mais je veux ici défendre l'Europe qui a su agir ces dernières années. Parce que notre Europe a su bâtir les fondements d'une Europe de la défense, ce qui paraissait impensable il y a 6-7 ans. Des fonds européens, une initiative européenne d'intervention, des facilités, le début de programmes communs, France-Allemagne, mais aussi avec beaucoup d'autres puissances. Nous avons su ensemble bâtir une réponse à la crise Covid. Je veux réinsister sur ce point, on l'oublie toujours. Mais on a eu en deux mois un accord franco-allemand, en trois mois une réponse européenne qui a réussi à lever de la dette en commun et bâtir un programme pour résister et aider nos économies et les relancer. On a bâti des grands programmes dans la santé, dans les semi-conducteurs, dans l'hydrogène en européen, avec là aussi un volontarisme pour avoir une plus grande souveraineté européenne. Et cet agenda de Versailles qu'on a bâti dès mars 2022, un mois après le début de la guerre en Ukraine, nous a permis de développer beaucoup plus de résilience dans nos secteurs économiques et d'avoir là aussi des programmes d'investissement importants. Et puis, nous avons su faire face en Europe à la crise avec une politique monétaire qui a permis de juguler l'inflation en des temps records de maintenir la croissance et de bâtir une gouvernance économique qu'on a réformée ces toutes dernières semaines qui nous a permis d'avoir un système qui est quand même plus favorable à la croissance qu'il ne l'était Tout ça donne des résultats. Tout ce que je viens de vous dire, très clairement, me permet de dire que non seulement ce que vous avez dit, on l'a fait, mais que ça marche. La France a créé 2 millions d'emplois durant les 6 dernières années. Elle a réindustrialisé. Nous avons commencé à réindustrialiser le pays. Là où nous avions fermé 600 usines après la crise financière, nous en avons ouvert 300 en net durant les 5 dernières années. Nous sommes depuis quatre ans consécutivement, le pays le plus attractif d'Europe, celui qui crée le plus de start-up et a les plus grosses levées de fonds, qu'il s'agisse d'ailleurs des start-up de services comme des deep tech, qu'il s'agisse du spatial, de la santé, de l'énergie ou autre. Là où il y a six ans, on me disait, mais n'allez pas trop vite pour décarboner votre parc automobile parce qu'on ne sait pas produire des véhicules électriques en Europe. Nous allons produire, il y a deux ans, un million de véhicules électriques en France, mais surtout nous avons installé quatre gigafactories dans notre pays et nous sommes en train de développer et de déployer tous les segments clés et avec l'ensemble des régions et plusieurs présidentes et présidents de régions françaises m'accompagnent aujourd'hui dans ce déplacement. Nous sommes parmi les leaders européens dans l'intelligence artificielle et le quantique et nous avons des talents formidables que nous continuons de former qu'on nous envie dans le monde entier, on y reviendra peut-être dans notre discussion, et sur ce sujet, nous avons eu aussi des champions qui ont été Et tout ça, nous l'avons fait en tenant nos objectifs et en revenant sur nos objectifs des accords de Paris. Là, nous n'étions pas dans notre trajectoire jusqu'en 2019. Là, depuis 2019, c'est la première période, on a réussi à doubler nos efforts et à réduire de 2% par an nos émissions. Et l'année dernière, en 2023, nous les avons réduites de 4,6% par an. Et grâce à la planification que nous avons mise en place, qui va décarboner beaucoup de secteurs, on va devoir tenir moins 5% par an. Ce qui veut dire qu'on peut avoir une stratégie de croissance, d'innovation, de création d'emplois, de plus grande souveraineté et de décarbonation. Et ça tombe bien parce qu'à mes yeux, il n'y a pas d'autre modèle pour les grands pays européens et d'ailleurs toutes les 
démocratie développée, c'est de tenir ensemble la création d'emplois et la réindustrialisation, l'agenda climat et biodiversité et une approche de souveraineté, en particulier climatique et énergétique, car nous avons vu ce que coûtait la dépendance pendant la crise Covid et au moment de lancement de la guerre russe en Ukraine. Ambition, réforme, investissement et résultats sont donc là. Maintenant, nous sommes à un tournant. On est à un tournant parce qu'on va rentrer dans une année qui va être décisive. D'abord, elle va être décisive parce que la France va pouvoir nous accueillir. Je fais mon moment de promotion française, professeur, mais l'année 2024, je le disais à nos compatriotes, sera un millésime français parce que j'espère accueillir beaucoup d'entre vous pour la célébration des 80 ans des débarquements en France, en Normandie en Provence, et le monde entier nous a The whole world nous came alliés together to help us, our allies, britanniques et américains British, et canadiens et venant parfois aussi Canadian du bout du monde et, et beaucoup de nos alliés aussi africains pour le débarquement et donc on va célébrer ce moment qui est la liberté, le fondement notre, de l'ordre libre que nous avons aujourd'hui en essayant d'en faire un temps diplomatique utile. Ensuite, il y aura les Jeux Olympiques et Paralympiques dans notre pays durant tout cet été, qui sera là aussi une rencontre importante, sportive, mais également culturelle, diplomatique, parce qu'elle porte les valeurs de l'Olympisme, qui sont des valeurs universelles. Et puis, nous aurons aussi à accueillir la francophonie, pour son, 30, son 19e sommet, pardon. et ça faisait 33 ans que la France n'avait pas accueilli un sommet de la francophonie, en même temps que nous rouvrirons la cathédrale Notre-Dame, 5 ans après l'incendie. Mais 2024 sera aussi une année au cœur de tous nos défis, parce que nous voyons bien le monde se recomposer sous nos yeux. Il y a une formidable accélération des innovations, il y a une accélération de tous les agendas et l'Europe est face à des très grandes difficultés dans cette réorganisation. Difficultés parce que tout va plus vite. L'intelligence artificielle innove à vitesse forcée et aujourd'hui, on le voit bien, même si je vantais nos mérites, c'est vrai que la France forme des talents à des vraies capacités et nous sommes sans doute un des tout premiers pays européens. Les états unis d'Amérique investissent beaucoup, la Chine aussi. C'est un agenda que nous, devons, que nous devons faire face sans naïveté. Ensuite, parce que après le lancement de la guerre russe en Ukraine, les conséquences sur les prix de l'énergie, l'Inflation Reduction Act aux états unis l'Europe a un énorme sujet de coût de son énergie en même temps de décarbonation. Et on voit bien, le monde se divise, il y a une très grande tension sino-américaine, il y a le retour de la guerre en Europe et au Proche-Orient, et un grand risque pour les Européens, au fond, d'avoir un agenda qui n'est pas tout à fait le bon, en tout cas qui ne va pas suffisamment. Alors les quelques convictions pour les dix dernières minutes de mon propos sont pour l'avenir et pour vous dire comment je vois les choses et l'agenda que la France et l'Europe ont porté. Premièrement, nous allons tout faire pour essayer de tenir le monde ensemble, ne pas céder au risque de division, et essayer d'avoir un agenda efficace qui, un, assurera le fait que la Russie ne peut ni ne doit gagner en Ukraine, parce qu'il en va de l'Ukraine, de nos valeurs, mais de notre sécurité collective, en Europe, au Caucase, dans, le, dans tout le voisinage. Et donc pour ce faire, 2024 sera une année clé pour les Européens. Nous devons montrer que nous savons donner de la visibilité, réengager nos efforts, quoi qu'il advienne aux états unis La deuxième chose, ce sera notre capacité à bâtir des solutions de paix au Proche-Orient. Nous portons un agenda paix et sécurité pour tous, lutte contre le terrorisme, contre tous les groupes terroristes qui sont dans la région, qui déstabilisent, on le voit bien, la sécurité, mais aussi le commerce mondial. On voit l'action des Houthis aujourd'hui, Babel Mandeb et ailleurs. Deuxièmement, action humanitaire, c'est pourquoi la France appelle à des aides massives, ce que nous avons fait, à des interventions comme nous l'avons fait pour aider très concrètement à Gaza, pour soigner aussi sur les côtes, mais un cessez-le-feu immédiat pour 
permettre d'apporter l'aide humanitaire aux populations. Et troisièmement, une solution politique des deux États qui est la seule à permettre la stabilité et la paix pour Israël et dans Israël. Et je crois que c'est un défi européen et les Européens ont des solutions à apporter sur ce sujet. Et puis sur le plan diplomatique, il nous faudra, nous Européens, faire pour que le monde ne se dise pas et avoir un agenda. Je crois que nous en avons jeté les bases en juillet dernier. En France, avec le pacte de Paris pour les peuples et la planète, c'est un agenda volontariste pour réconcilier la lutte contre la pauvreté et la lutte pour le climat et la biodiversité. Et ne laisser aucun pays à revenu intermédiaire ou pauvre, pays vulnérable, et parfois pays qui cumulent ces vulnérabilités en situation de choisir, par un réengagement massif d'abord des financements internationaux publics et privés par un agenda défini avec les pays qui s'agissent de leur transition énergétique, climatique et de biodiversité. Mais au-delà de ça, nous avons besoin d'avoir un agenda économique d'innovation et industrielle encore plus ambitieux. Tout ce qu'on a fait ces dernières années, les très bons résultats que je vous ai donnés, ne sont pas suffisants parce qu'il y a une accélération de l'innovation et du monde. Parce qu'il y a eu une accélération aussi avec l'IRA et avec euh, en particulier ce qui se fait sur le quantique. Et donc pour ce faire, fort des résultats que nous avons obtenus so du fait que quand il y a 6 ans, je suis venu vous dire quelque chose. Six years ago, I came et de vous dire ce que je voudrais qu'on qu fasse en français, ce que je voudrais qu'on fasse en européen. Nous allons ouvrir un temps de, de l'accélération, de l'attractivité, de l'innovation en France. D'abord en consolidant le grand programme France 2030, le programme d'activité avec Business France, pour continuer de faire davantage et rester leader européen sur ce sujet. Nous allons ensuite ouvrir un deuxième temps sur la réforme de notre marché du travail, en durcissant les règles de l'assurance chômage, en ayant aussi beaucoup plus de simplicité sur les embauches et l'organisation, et en favorisant tout ce qu'on peut transférer au niveau de l'entreprise dans les négociations. Ensuite, nous allons à nouveau ouvrir un grand train de simplification et de réduction des délais dans de nombreux secteurs. Je l'ai annoncé hier, simplification, accélération, montée des seuils et décalage des seuils, réduction des délais pour les grands projets industriels, les projets agricoles, les projets dans le renouvelable, les projets dans le logement. In agriculture, Ensuite, in nous allons housing. poursuivre la dynamique de réindustrialisation We avec de nouvelles mesures d'attractivité, en particulier pour attirer les financements. Et nous allons stabiliser And le cadre réglementaire du secteur de l'énergie. Sur ce point, les six derniers mois ont été consacrés à une négociation européenne qui nous a permis d'obtenir un marché européen qui sera beaucoup plus stable et régulé. On dépendra beaucoup moins des coûts marginaux. Ce qui pour nous, Français, est très important Regulated, parce qu'on produit une énergie qui est pilotable, qui est stable et qui est décarbonée cost, grâce au nucléaire. Et donc, nous allons, dans la loi, transposer ces équilibres so, et donner de la visibilité aux ménages comme aux entreprises sur une énergie qui sera uh, l'une des plus décarbonées d'Europe, des plus stables et des moins chères avec aussi des contrats à long terme que nous allons signer avec des industries. À côté de ça, on va continuer notre stratégie d'investissement dans le capital humain en renforçant les institutions de travail, en formant mieux nos jeunes. On a fait une réforme très importante de l'apprentissage. On a formé 250 000 jeunes par an à l'apprentissage en formant maintenant 1 million par an. Et on va poursuivre cet effort et on va le faire sur nos lycées professionnels. Et nous allons complètement enclencher une réforme du premier cycle universitaire pour mieux allouer nos formations aux besoins de la nation. On va poursuivre l'accélération de notre recherche avec une série de réformes que j'ai annoncées il y a quelques semaines, en plus des investissements qui ont été décidés et le renforcement des investissements dans les secteurs clés, dont l'intelligence artificielle, le quantique ou euh, le climat. Au-delà de cette stratégie française, nous allons pousser un agenda européen et continuer sur la base de ce qui a été fait dans cette année d'élection européenne, parce qu'évidemment, l'Europe est la bonne échelle pour mener une telle ambition. 
Et au fond, au moment où je vous parle, ma conviction est que l'Europe a fait beaucoup de choses très bien ces dernières années. Nous avons ensemble été au rendez-vous de la crise Covid et nous avons ensemble été au rendez-vous de la guerre en Ukraine. Personne ne pensait que les Européens pourraient se mettre d'accord à trois mois face au Covid. Personne ne pensait que les Européens pourraient livrer des vaccins. Personne ne pensait qu'on pouvait en quelques jours avoir une position commune et sanctionner la Russie et tenir pendant deux ans. On l'a fait. Et l'on sort des résultats économiques monétaires économique que j'évoquais, je pense qu'on doit faire beaucoup On a d'abord besoin d'avoir une Europe de l'investissement Pour moi, c'est une priorité. Tout ce que je vous dis sur le quantique, sur le clean tech et même sur la défense, c'est beaucoup plus d'argent. Et donc, il faut une stratégie de l'investissement qui doit marcher avec deux moteurs. Il faut plus d'investissements publics européens. Et donc, nous devons ouvrir une phase de nouveau réinvestissement, comme on l'a fait dans la crise Covid, et peut-être en osant à nouveau des eurobonds sur des priorités. La première ministre estonienne a eu le courage, dans un pays qui était plutôt réputé pour être frugal, comme on dit, de proposer des eurobonds pour l'industrie de défense et l'Ukraine. Allons-y sur des grandes priorités d'avenir. Mais on doit investir beaucoup plus. Et puis à côté de ça, il nous faut aussi approfondir l'union des marchés de capitaux. Nous devons absolument avoir une Europe financière qui soit beaucoup plus intégrée. Pourquoi Parce que notre continent a beaucoup d'épargne. Mais cette épargne est mal allouée. Elle ne circule pas vers les bonnes géographies, elle ne circule pas vers les bons secteurs. Ce sont nos propres blocages. Alors si on bloque à 27, la France va proposer d'avancer sur une coopération renforcée sur ce sujet, car on doit avancer absolument. Ensuite, l'Europe doit porter un agenda environnemental encore plus ambitieux, mais qui soit un agenda d'investissement et d'innovation. On a fait beaucoup en matière de régulation. Nous sommes le continent, le seul continent qui a assumé la neutralité carbone, le seul continent qui a passé les règles au niveau européen pour le faire. Mais on ne peut pas être durablement le seul qui régule à ce niveau et celui qui investit le moins. Et c'est ce qui se passe. Les États-Unis d'Amérique ont décidé, sans tout à fait respecter les règles du commerce mondial, de sursubventionner les clean tech, et les Chinois sursubventionnent l'ensemble des industries qui contribuent. Si nous n'y prenons garde, on sera un continent qui respecte toutes les règles, nous sommes même à les respecter, mais on n'aura plus que des consommateurs et plus d'industriels. Donc il nous faut absolument investir beaucoup plus dans les clean tech. Et il nous faut aussi investir beaucoup plus dans l'intelligence artificielle, les semi-conducteurs de plus petite taille, les data centers, pour pouvoir avoir une stratégie cohérente également en la matière. Et enfin, cette stratégie industrielle passera par une Europe sociale renouvelée. Et je considère que nous avons besoin de consolider notre modèle de concertation, de trouver des solutions pour les emplois durables, de relancer au niveau européen les concertations pour accompagner ces mutations technologiques. Parce qu'il est clair que nous avons aussi besoin, je le disais à quelques gens tout à l'heure, ça fait écho aux propos que j'avais eu avec vous hier. Si on veut avoir un agenda de soutenabilité, eh ben, il faut investir plus, il faut aller plus fort sur le climat et l'intelligence artificielle, il faut faire plus de réformes, mais il faut aussi qu'on continue de changer le modèle qui est le nôtre en créant davantage d'un en Europe et des emplois mieux rémunérés. Au fond, il faut que vous m'aidiez, que vous nous aidiez à créer plus de good jobs. Parce que tout à l'heure, un intervenant me disait comment avoir plus de stabilité en Europe. Je disais très simplement, aidez-nous à donner de l'espoir aux classes moyennes. Pourquoi toutes les démocraties en Europe et ailleurs vivent des crises Parce que les classes moyennes et les classes populaires ne sont plus heureuses avec ce qu'on fait. Mais ce n'est pas que le problème des, di des dirigeants, c'est aussi et surtout le problème de tous les corps constitués, et en particulier des entreprises. On doit changer là aussi de modèle dans cette révolution complète où nous vivons. Et il faut créer beaucoup plus d'emplois et d'emplois mieux payés qui permettront d'adhérer à ces transitions. That will allow people to embrace the transition. In a context where we have put a lot of money into COVID, in the COVID crisis, into business to support good jobs, and to pay for it. So we need good jobs, well-paid jobs, and to support business to support good jobs. So we need good jobs, well-paid jobs, and to support business to support good jobs. So we need good jobs, well-paid jobs, and to support business to support good jobs. So we need good jobs, well-paid jobs, and to support business to support good jobs. So we need good jobs, well-paid jobs, and to support business to support good jobs. So we need good jobs, well-paid j
Je vais donc confirmer ma promesse, mais voilà l'agenda tel que je le vois sur année, les années qui viennent, à la fois pour la France de manière sommaire et pour l'Europe. Je suis un optimiste. Je pense que l'Europe a beaucoup fait qu'elle est là. Nous sommes à un temps de défi. Et l'Europe, cette année en particulier, lors des élections, mais par les choix qu'elle aura à faire sur l'Ukraine, sur le Proche-Orient et sur sa stratégie climatique, économique et d'innovation et sociale, aura à dessiner son avenir. Nous avons les moyens de le faire. Si nous sommes lucides et ambitieux, c'est dans cet esprit que j'entame l'année. Merci bien, Monsieur le Président, d'être à la disposition pour une discussion encore. Et j'ai reçu déjà certaines questions de l'audience. Mais je veux vous demander. Je vais parler anglais parce que cette discussion va se dérouler en anglais maintenant. Vous avez parlé de. Substantially about the agenda of Europe, the integration of Europe. But my first question would be: What is actually your vision, long term, for the sovereignty and governance of Europe? Uh, thank you, Klaus. And for me, this is one of the critical points, and I always advocated for a more sovereign Europe. What does it mean? It's just, I mean, it's, it doesn't mean killing lo your links, your alliances, and your partnerships, but it's not to be over-dependent on critical sectors of your value chains and some geographies. I think we perfectly, when I advocated this issue six years ago, it was not totally shared. But I think we experienced during the pandemic the cost of over-dependencies, masks, some critical devices, vaccines, and we experienced during the, the Ukrainian war the, the over-dependencies on energy. So for me, a more sovereign Europe means that we have to be sure that we have European production of brain, so sovereign intelligence, I would say, key technologies, and critical part of the value chain, from chips, to agriculture, from energy, meaning renewables and nuclear, because this is the one you produce on your soil and which is decarbonized, to a critical part of your defense industry. This is absolutely critical if we want to avoid the cost of a big crisis and the fragmentation of this world. It will take a decade to do so. This is why I think in the meanwhile, we have to avoid any escalation intention and this is why I'm part of those who are not pushing for an escalation and tension between China and US, to be totally frank, in this room. And our strategy vis-à-vis -vis China in this context is not the decoupling strategy, but the de-risking strategy. And a fair, lucid, and open de-risking strategy, which is totally accepted by China, which allows us to cooperate, but which will prevent us from being too much dependent on some critical part of our value chain. But let's be clear, it's not good for Europe as well to be totally dependent on the US on some part of the value chain. Otherwise, you create a sort of extraterritoriality of the dollar, and Europe is not a geopolitical reality. This is the condition to preserve jobs, growth for our continent, and this is absolutely critical to preserve our voice in, uh, uh, in this world and to speak with the different countries. And I want to speak with Asia, I want to speak with Africa and so on, as a European and not, not as somebody being seen as totally dependent on the US and so on. And I think this is the European dream. I see some good friends and good leaders. I know that Alexander Vucic in, in Serbia has exactly this agenda. And when this country is on this path for the European Union, is precisely because the, the European Union is a project of not being dependent on big powers, and not a project of hegemony, but balance, equilibrium, and respect. And this is the one I do share. 
So this is the path. But it will request reforms, it will request investments, it will request to avoid any escalation in tension, but it's clear that we will have to invest and make some bold decisions like the one I mentioned for uh, our capital market union, our climate and so on, because if we are lucid today, one of our weakness in this strategy of sovereignty is that we are too much fragmented. The second is we are probably one of the critical parts of this world where we regulate much more than the others and sometimes we invest less than the others. And this is not a business model. Mr. President, I, I have here some requests uh, from the audience uh, to ask questions and I would first call on Julie Sweet, the chair and CEO of Accenture. Julie, where are, where are you sitting? Yeah. You get the microphone. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you, President Macron, for being here and for your continued focus on making France attractive for investment at Accenture. We're very proud of our over 10,000 people there and growing. And soon we will be opening one of our first 10 Gen AI innovation hubs in France. And so that leads me to my question. Um, as the EU AI Act has been finalized, um, and there's a lot of questions around how to adopt it, and how are you thinking about the balance of making sure we have absolutely the right responsible regulation, and we are making sure that businesses can continue to innovate? Thank you. So, thank you. So the question is, how are you thinking about the regulation of AI and making sure that businesses are able to continue to innovate so that France can be a leader in using this power for technology to transform? Uh, thank you very much. I mean, obviously, this is one of the critical questions. First, I'm a strong believer in AI and the fact that it will provide growth and a lot of opportunities. We launched a strategy seven years ago, and I want here to insist on the fact that France is clearly, I think, an attractive and competitive country for AI. And I think our main asset is that we have a lot of talents, we educate and we train a lot of talents. From Paris Saclay to a lot of our universities, we have a lot of mathematicians, data scientists, and a lot of talents absolutely critical for this industry, and a lot of them are employed everywhere in the world. If you go to Silicon Valley, I mean, you have a lot of AI talents, and they are trained and educated in France. We want to keep them as well and to, to, to have them in our industry. But this is the first asset we have on AI. The second is we have a proper strategy, and now a vivid ecosystem in the different parts of the value chain, from LLM, from the training models, a company, but as well, on the hardware part. And this, this is the third, I think, competitive advantage of France. We do provide low carbon, pilotable, and competitive energy. And it's super important for AI because one of the critical points will, will be to have a lot of processing and calculating capacities. So a lot of big calcu super calculators and quantity calculators, a lot of data centers, so a lot of energy and low carbon energy. Nuclear plants are a great asset for that, and I launched a, great, a, a big strategy to deploy more. And all the regions being present here are very much engaged in this strategy. So we are competitive, we create a lot of companies, and we have, we are, we have more and more investments, and big tickets are being launched today in France and in Europe. I want to preserve this dynamic. So, I express myself quite openly. I was a little bit skeptical when we rushed as Europeans to regulate. Because I think we do need a strong convergence and synchronization, especially between Europe and US on this issue. Now, as for the consequence of AI and the regulation, I see an agenda which should be divided in, in different areas. On industry, I think AI should be accompanied. We need to accelerate and clearly maximize growth and opportunities. 
it's quite clear that AI could be as, and probably much more than robotization was, a way to improve productivity of low qualified and middle qualified workers. And this is why this strategy is the one which could improve productivity in a lot of our countries. So we should deploy a fair, well-balanced, but ambitious strategy in this field. Second, and, and we have to accompany the move in terms of training and requalification for a lot of our workers. Second, it's clear that AI will have and already have some impacts on a lot of uh, way to proceed from education, science, and so on. And we have to invest much more in order to innovate and be part of this competition because it will create probably a lot of acceleration, especially on healthcare. And it's very important for a lot of these sectors. Third, it's clear that we need regulation to be sure that our collective preferences are respected on the innovation I mentioned already, but especially on the functioning of our democracy. This is why one of the critical points we are working very hard on is the regulation on deep fakes and the regulation on critical impacts on our democracies. And uh, we are coordinating with some leaders on that. I hope we will manage to have a, a gathering and first initiatives in the months to come to precisely try to build a common framework to regulate deepfakes and AI issues, to regulate AI and users of AI in time of elections for democracies. And uh, it's one of the, for me, the critical emergency. My last point is that we will host this year a second conference on AI. We will focus on growth, but as well on safety. And this will be the best, it will be the best way to see how to have a proper regulation. For me, first, you need a global regulation, not just a European one. And at least you need US plus Europe. Second, you have to make some stress tests in terms of regulation, meaning you need to regulate deep fakes, you need to regulate some critical contents. And third, you have to provide a sort of regulation by design and in a certain way, as we made, I don't want to have an excessive comparison, but we learn with very complicated sectors like insurance how to regulate and create indirect responsibilities. You regulate key players and they are in charge of and you make control. It will be sort of the same structure of regulation for AI. It's how to put by design some regulation, making sure that our collective preferences are preserved and operating some stress tests on, on the key players. Here are the main remarks I wanted to make. So, no, uh, we have, we yeah. have, we, I have to go uh, uh, on Ukraine. Yes, a question. Oh, okay. okay. Because we have some other people who have already. Uh, regarding uh, Ukraine's potential uh, NATO membership, uh, we know Vladimir Putin considers uh, this uh, a no-go zone for him. And NATO has said that as long as there's war in Ukraine, this means it cannot become a member. So this provides a formula for Putin of permanent war. For as long as war continues, then Ukraine cannot achieve NATO membership. How do you get around this uh, tricky issue? I'm sorry, I take, I take that because there's a reverberation here. It's very hard to listen properly. I hope it's not the same in, for, for your side. Uh, look. You, it's fair that this is a statement of NATO, and you're right. But I think what we started with NATO was very important and is very useful for Ukraine because we have a strong coordination between NATO members and so on. This is why what we proposed is to have some critical members, bilateral agreements, providing security guarantees. And it's not contingent or dependent on, uh, on uh, accession to NATO. Prime Minister uh, Sunak made a trip a uh, few days ago and signed such an agreement. We are finalizing the same type of agreement with Ukraine, and this is what is important for them. So you're right for a full-fledged membership, but this is, in a certain way, a shadow, which is very useful and, and a sort of pressure for uh, 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 President Putin. But in parallel, 
all the bilateral security guarantees we provide and these bilateral treaties, plus the efforts we make, are the ones to help Ukraine. Thank you for your question. May I call now on uh, Higashi Yara-san, the executive cha uh, chairman of Dashi uh, Japan. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, my name is Higashi Hara, uh, chairman of uh, Hitachi. And, uh, you know, Hitachi provides uh, 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 intelligent infrastructure, a railway system or a power grid system. And uh, Hitachi already decided uh, to invest Tales in France, right? I'm looking forward to working with the people from Tales and uh, President Macron. My question is, you've already answered some of them. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, how you will realize carbon neutrality and uh, sustainable power supply after growing uh, utilization of generative AI? As you know, generative AI is, uh, uh, will uh, uh, require the huge energy. Some paper uh, anticipate that associated data center uh, will consume 1,000 times uh, more energy in 2050 than now. Uh, this is the uh, you know, significant challenge. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it is not only from the, uh, what I, uh, not only from the su sustainable power su supply, uh, but, uh, not on, but also, it is a, a climate change perspective. So it is, we need innovation from, from both the, from the uh, demand and the source uh, perspective. Uh, it is, uh, in this, I think it is uh, uh, important for us to consider about uh, demand side. Demand side, for example, the, we have to develop uh, energy saving semiconductor and uh, uh, algorithm and all, as, as well as uh, uh, energy saving and uh, uh, distributed use of data center and the supply side need to uh, think about you mentioned new expanding nuclear also acceleration of the uh, nuclear fusion technology uh, development and uh, I'd like to uh, know much more detail about this kind of energy uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very comprehensive approach, and you're right that we have to take in all together climate change, artificial intelligence, and all the, all the innovation. And uh, I, I think your point is very important to insist on the fact that artificial intelligence will require much more electricity and energy capacity. So what we are doing and what we will do, we are, I think, the first developed countries to have adopted a planification. We worked, so first we started in the different sectors to reduce our consumption and to reduce our emissions. And what we did is that we designed a strategy sector by sector in order to be compliant with Paris Agreement. And in fact, the most complicated part is between now and 2030. And the other one is at the very end to have an actual total carbon neutrality. So we have a planification taking from agriculture to industry to a real estate, taking companies to households, the type of efforts and the targets year per year to be developed. We have some investment program, we accompany them, we invest, and so on. So this is our strategy, it is adopted. Now we are deploying this strategy on our territory, region by region, because the sensitivity is not the same and it should be adapted to the territory. But having said that, what are the key pillars of this approach? First, for households, the two main issues are the, the reduction of their consumption and this is clearly the renovation of flats and houses. And we accompany them by financing all the renovation 
all this works, it creates jobs, this is quite sophisticated, we, we have the first results and we will increase the efforts. Second is to change our cars and getting rid of, getting rid of the old car with quite high emission in order to have obviously electrical cars but as well in the years to come hybrid on new generation because they reduce like crazy their emission. And at the same time to be sure that we produce in Europe as well these cars to have a strategy which can be, which can be climate change and jobs and industrialization. Third, on industry, which is a big sector of uh, uh, CO2 emission, we have a big decarbonization strategy. And in France, it's very simple. We identify the fact that if we manage to decarbonize 50 industrial sites, just 50, we deliver half of the effort. Can you imagine? But this is big steel, aluminum, cement industry, the big harbor. And from Le Havre to Marseille, coming to Paris and so on, this is what we are doing. So we are investing a lot of billions in the framework of France 2030. We started to sign this agreement and we finance long-term contracts for electricity. We finance a lot of re-engineering of the production in order to do so. This is what we are doing. And we get results because I doubled the effort. Six years ago, when I were in front of you, we reduced by 1% per year our CO2 emission. Two years later, we, read, we started to reduce by 2% per year. We did it during four years. Last year, we reduced by 4.6%. So it's working. And we will, it will work by this aggregated effort. And the fact that we make this strategy, I think, fair between the different sectors, and we have to engage the different territories and our people. And our fellow citizens are the main partners in such a strategy. They want just to be sure that there is a fair share and everybody contributes. And this is what we do. In parallel, on energy, I think we have a very good strategy and we had an historical advantage. 70% of the electricity I produced is based on nuclear. I have almost no dependence on gas. By 2027, we will get rid of coal. I still have two coal plants. They are used sometimes in order not to be totally dependent, but I reduced. I closed already two. In the two to three years to come, we will get rid of all of them. So no more coal. So we will be in advance uh, in comparison with the target of 2030. And on our, ne our energy, our strategy is based on efficiency, how to reduce emission, more nuclear, and on that we already announced six new reactors, and I will announce by June eight new reactors. The equivalent of EPR, and we will perhaps make a mix between EPR, SMRs, and in parallel we launch a big program on in of innovation. I recognize a few players, and we have a new nuke sector because EDF is a main player and produ is producing EPR and will produce EPR2 in France and elsewhere. But we want to develop as well a lot of startups to deploy additional offer and to innovate to develop as well new technologies from the SMRs to uh, uh, the fusion, to the laser, and so on and so on. But in capacity, we will have the equivalent of the six plus eight reactors on top of what we have and the renovation we are making. And obviously, in parallel, so efficiency, nuclear, and renewables, so we are deploying uh, new capacities, especially in, on offshore wind, and we planified the new site. What we will do in the six months to come, because all this strategy was deployed in order to be completely compliant with the big electrification of our mobility, and to have carbon neutrality by 2050. What we are doing is we are stressing our scenario to see if we go to the maximum and we deploy more data centers, more supercalculators in order to face the explosion of AI, what is the additional need in terms of low carbon electricity we have. And we will adapt our strategy 
between now and the years to come in order to be sure that we make compatible carbon neutrality and AI strategy. And guess what? AI is a big help to innovate much more rapidly, to decarbonize some sectors, and to improve the, the efficiency part. So I think, thanks to AI and the acceleration, we will probably be more efficient on the reduction of our consumption and the efficiency pillar, but it is clear that we will probably have to increase in the years to come new reactors and new renewable capacities in order to produce on our soils low carbon electricity to have more data centers and more supercalculators. It's a little bit technical, I'm sorry, but I wanted to have a comprehensive answer of your question. Mr. President, um, I still have here a number of questions, but I was informed that we have run out of time. Uh, but um, let me ask you uh, one final question. Um, it was very impressive, the track record you have, uh, if I compare what you announced when you were here last time and what you have achieved. Now, when you come back next time, what will be the single most important issue you will tell us you made progress? What do you feel you would be particularly proud of? Uh, this, sovereign, this sovereignty agenda you started yeah. with. Yeah. I think we are 2024, 2025 will be the years where European countries and the EU as a, an entity will be in a situation to decide if we want to be sovereign or not. And the critical decisions are quite simple. Ukraine, our neighborhood, and especially peace in the uh, in Middle East and, uh, and, and, and Africa, but stability, and condition to create new good jobs in decarbonized industry and having these new sectors like AI, space, quantum, chip, and defense as a business. I think here are the pillars of sovereign approach, and I think in the, if, we, if we are able to be united, if we invest big time in these sectors, if we innovate, if we are demanding to ourselves as governance, as business leaders, to precisely deploy these solutions. And if we take bold diplomatic decisions, especially on Ukraine, we can deliver this agenda. For me, this is a critical point. Monsieur le Président, vous souhaitez uh, grand succès. Dans Mr. President, we wish you every, every success. success. Uh, un grand merci que vous soyez venu uh, chez nous uh, endeavors, and thank you so much for being here today. Pour, uh, we do wish you every success in achieving all of these uh, Thank you, Professor. Perhaps I could say one Merci word. Tous pour avoir un mot I would like to thank you all. And perhaps just a word of conclusion for all of you. Lieu Davos is always mondiale. a Les venue for a global vrai. conversation where people des can get together. Lucide. Be realistic, si but be optimistic. If you look at 2024, a lot of people are going to say, oh, it's going to be dreadful. But there are a lot of important things that are going to be celebrations in France, the Olympics and Paralympics. Of course, war is there. There are terrible disasters going on. But I truly believe that the best, the decisions that can change things are in our hands, within our hands. Decision makers, be they governance, regulators, leaders of the economy, NGOs, and so on. I think we need to reach a consensus. And I think that consensus exists. Russia cannot win the war in Ukraine. We must do everything to rebuild sustainable and lasting peace in the Middle East. And we must, we must create good jobs at home and decarbonize quicker. We just need to sync our agendas and align our agendas. And that's what we need to dedicate our energy on to. But be optimistic for the coming year. We have everything it takes to succeed. We have plenty of assets in hand. And I believe that we Europeans have a lot of great strengths to contribute to the world. We just need to dedicate our energy and optimism. May 2024 be a year as successfully able as we've made the right decisions. Many thanks.